Explore some of the best resources and opportunities for veterans at azpbs.org slash veterans. Arizona PBS celebrates Arizona history with a moment in time, made possible by Rock Springs Cafe. Located in Grand Canyon Village, the Hopi House opened in 1905. Designed by architect Mary Jane Coulter, the house is now a museum for American Indian arts and crafts. Coming soon to Arizona PBS. All right, at 745, this is the latest on the incident out of Stu Milk. When news of a sexual assault shakes a community. I had never seen a case constructed like this. A small town investigation becomes a national reckoning. Roll, red roll. All new, Monday night at 11.30 on Arizona PBS. From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. We tell you more about a seven-year-old girl from India who died while trying to come to the U.S. A Border Patrol agent and members of the Center of Immigration Studies give us more insight. Also, creating dishes with edibles, a valley phlebotomist combines his passion for curing others and cooking. Plus, two Phoenix Rising players are hitting the field to win a different championship this year. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Gabriela Collage. And I'm Kevin Thompson. Thank you for joining us. The body of a young girl was found in the Arizona desert. According to U.S. Customs and Border Protection, the child is believed to be from India. Reporter Tanaya Williamson joins us from the Broadcast Center with more information. Authorities say the U.S. Border Patrol located the girl's mother and eight-year-old sister who she'd been traveling with. The mother and daughter were taken to the hospital to be treated for dehydration. I spoke with an agent from Border Patrol and a member from the Center of Immigration Studies on what an incident like this means going forward. The body of the young girl was found in the desert yesterday morning, according to a press release from U.S. Customs and Border Protection. The reason why this happens is because the unscrupulous smuggling organizations went and dropped these people in the border in a very remote area. They were dropped about 17 miles west of the port of entry at Lukeville. Jesus Vasavilbaso is a public affairs officer at the Tucson Sector Border Patrol and says that people seeking asylum often end up being taken advantage of. I think because the smuggling organizations are lying to these people, are promising that they're going to be able to get legal status when that's not the case. It's absolutely tragic, and I think it speaks to the the, the issues of, of, of the pull factors bringing people to this country and why it's so important that we ensure that people don't have to make this, this extremely dangerous journey where, unfortunately, children are dying. Matthew Sussis, Assistant Director of Communications at the Center for Immigration Studies, says that people are bringing children along with them because our current laws allow it. Uh, if you look at the Rio Grande Valley, almost none of the single men had children with them. Now about half are bringing children with them, and that's directly in response to these openings in our asylum law. So that's what's drawing all the children to get brought on, which, which really a very dangerous and uh, uh, very unsafe journey. The United States is also seeing an increase in immigrants from Asian and Central American countries, something that Sussis also believes is a result of current policy. The idea of safe third country would be that a country like Mexico, if people cross through Mexico from Guatemala on their way to the U.S., um, they have to apply for asylum in Mexico first. But right now we don't have that, which means that anyone from any part of the world, whether it's Africa or Asia or Central or South America, can travel all the way up through the, through the Americas, through Mexico, and then apply for asylum uh, at the U.S. and then in all likelihood they'll be allowed to the country. So that's what's driving those global flows. Basa Villabaso says that people traveling in such harsh conditions are often acting out of desperation and are hurt when situations like this happen. We're part of the community and we also have children, so it breaks our heart when something like this happens. And regardless of your legal status, we don't want anybody to get hurt out there. The high temperature in the area where the girl was found is believed to be near 108 degrees. In the newsroom, Tanai Williamson, Cronkite News. U.S. Immigration and Customs is considering opening a second permanent facility for transgender migrants. They want to put this in place so that they can be detained amid the arrival of Central Americans crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. 
The first facility opened in Milan, New Mexico in 2017. Enforcement removal operations say the space would be an investment given the amount of costs related to transgender migrants. About 300 migrants who identify as transgender have been taken into the custody of U.S. immigration since October 1st, marking the highest number since officials began keeping track in 2015. A new Arizona takeout spot is cooking up an array of dining options, but you have to have more than a loyalty card to get your hands on these dishes. I met the chef cooking up creations in a Guadalupe dispensary's cannabis kitchen. Pizza, pasta, cupcakes, and artisan burgers, all of which give the term plant-based foods a whole new meaning. At the mint dispensary in Guadalupe, workers grow, harvest, and cook with their marijuana. I have a medical background. Chef Christopher Valle is also a phlebotomist. He says his food provides medicinal marijuana patients with options beyond the more mainstream edibles. They're going home happy with something new and then they go, they go home and they try and they get even more happier because it's something good and nutritious. Marketing director Raul Molina says a recent Arizona Supreme Court ruling made this all possible. Obviously, it was key. Uh, had the decision gone the opposite way, it probably would have been a brand new, a re scratch and restart here inside the kitchen. The court ruled in May that marijuana extracts and resins are protected under the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act. We, we were really happy that the state finally allowed us to open up the kitchen and to be able to, once again, take another step towards eliminating the taboos and, you know, what's talked about as far as cannabis and helping people understand it a little bit better by making it more mainstream. Will Humble, executive director of the Arizona Public Health Association, says the ruling also extends other protections. So I think it's given some reassurance to both patients that the things that they buy from um, dispensaries are okay as long as they have the allowable amount and for dispensaries that the business models that they've built around the edible portion of the medical marijuana industry are okay. And for Chef Valle, who grew up in a restaurant environment, this kitchen is a chance to mix his passion with medicine. Like if you combine like the, with the, the benefits of marijuana with the benefits of a nutritious meal, it, it will help the patients as well as the industry. The Arizona Supreme Court issued that ruling in May when it threw out the conviction of Rodney Jones. He's a medicinal card holder who was arrested for possessing marijuana extract, but the court says he was protected under the law. While cannabis kitchens are no strangers to the state of California, Arizona may offer some benefits that California residents are missing out on. The trending hashtag CA struggles has been circulating the internet and can be spotted on cars in Silicon Valley. It's part of a marketing campaign by the Greater Phoenix Economic Council that aids hope to recruit Californians to move to Arizona because of cheaper homes, lower taxes and shorter commutes to work. Relief at the pump. Arizonans are expected to see a drop in gas prices around the valley soon. Experts say this has a lot to do with the supply of oil being high, but the demand remains low. Prices are expected to settle around $3 a gallon here in the valley over the next few days. Arizona and eight other states remain above $3 per gallon, but the national average is currently at $2.73 a gallon. If you're looking to book a summer trip soon, hopefully you can secure your flight before more airlines raise their prices. American Airlines has increased one-way fares on domestic flights by $5. J.P. Morgan analysts say Southwest and Hawaiian Airlines also appear to have raised their rates too. These price hikes worry travelers, but investors say it's actually good news and shows there's still demand. Shares of American Airlines, Hawaiian Airlines, and Southwest all surged Thursday after the changes. This summer, youth interested in law enforcement careers are able to get their feet wet in the Maricopa County Cadet Program before they are old enough to become sworn police officers. Cronkite News reporter Kevin Fleischman shows us what it takes. Uh, in our canine division and then our bomb squad. So all of us together, every time we get called out to a search warrant. This cadet academy keeps many young adults focused and out of trouble, says Maricopa County Sheriff Deputy Rob Merritt. A lot of times, uh, young men and women that want to go into law enforcement, they slip up somewhere between 18 and 21. Programs like this keep them on that straight and narrow so when they do turn 21, they're ready to go right into it and, and hit it head on. Protecting others motivates many of the cadets. I think a lot of these kids truly like the structure, um, the command structure that is involved with, with uh, the program. Um, I think they 
a lot of them, if you ask them, they want to help people. In the program, cadets work as a team and learn firearm safety, self-defense tactics, and CPR training. It can be physically demanding. One of the best things is you see the confidence building over the, the entire two weeks. Um, if we would have put them in some of these situations nine days ago, they would have probably turned around and said, I'm, I'm done. All of the 22 cadets who started the academy made it to the end. In Phoenix, Kevin Fleischman, Cronkite News. This is the third year the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office has offered this training. For more information, you can visit mcsocadets.com. Temperatures are still hot here in the valley. And they're going to stay that way for a while. Ryan, Ryan Sundin tells us more about the upcoming weather for next week. Ryan. Yeah, guys, it's going to be hot for the rest of the summer. As we know, monsoon season starts tomorrow, so let's all get ready for that. Right now it's 98 here in Phoenix, and it's going to be pretty much 98 all here in South Arizona. It gets 20 degrees cooler up there in the Grand Canyon. But for tomorrow, it starts off cooler with 83 degrees and then it goes all the way up to 102. So that's a 20 degree difference. So I would always say go out a little bit early if you're planning on going out. Tomorrow and the rest of the week, we kind of stay around the same temperatures. We're at 103 with our high hitting Thursday at 106. So if you want to have a great week, it's going to be hot. So get ready for it. Live from the Weather Center, Ryan Sundin. Phoenix Rising FC is a team of multicultural athletes brought together to compete for championships. As Ryan Sundin reports, two of those Phoenix Rising players are embarking on an international journey this summer to try and win a different championship, the Gold Cup. Junior Flemings joins Kavon Lambert on the Jamaica national team, leaving their Phoenix Rising teammates to play in the Gold Cup. I mean, it's always an honor, you know, you got called up to represent the country. I mean, you're not only representing yourself, you're not only representing your teammate, but the entire nation, you know, is looking to you to do something special where, where they can celebrate. The Gold Cup is a tournament of nations hailing from Central America, the Caribbean, and North America. Junior Flemings hopes this time he can change the narrative for Jamaica. I mean, the last two Gold Cups says a lot. We went to back-to-back -back finals. So, I mean, who knows? Third time, is it a charm? Who knows? But we have high expectations to perform well. And I think this one was sure we're going to go really hard to try to win it. So it would be a good test for us. Phoenix Rising FC's season does not stop for the Gold Cup. While the two Jamaicans are gone, this opens up opportunities for other players. We're adding guys that fit the system. So, yes, you'd love to have Kevon, you'd love to have Junior, but the idea now is that if a guy leaves or a guy gets hurt, that the next one comes in and it's really the team. It's, uh, you know, I kind of, I could use the Patriots and, and what Bill Belichick has done as a, as a model a little bit and that if the system is so good and they buy into it and they believe in what the coaches are doing, Phoenix Rising won their last game with Junior on the field and are now on a four-game win streak. In Phoenix, Ryan Sundin, Cronkite News. Phoenix Rising FC is hoping to keep that winning streak going this Saturday at 7.30 p.m., where they will take on Orange County SC at Casino Arizona Field. Coming up, we highlight some of our best stories of the week. We tell you more about one group of dental offices opening doors for veterans in need and Native American men and women experiencing violence. How local tribe members from across the country met earlier this week to talk about this public safety issue. Stay in the know, on the go. At Cronkite News, we work hard to report the facts and keep you updated, whether we're on set, or on the scene. Taking it from the studio to the field. So I'm here in South Phoenix. In Phoenix, we're just a click away. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or find us online at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Millions of people die every year from drinking dirty water. I would never have felt I had the ability to do something without ASU pushing me. We built filtration systems out of local materials with the people. To see those kids drink clean water for the first time, it's the most rewarding feeling that you can ever have. I went to ASU because I wanted to change the world. The thing I never would have expected is how the world would have changed me. 
I'm Matt Barry, ESPN Sports Center anchor and graduate of ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. With its bachelor's and master's degrees in sports journalism, the Cronkite School is preparing the next generation of sports journalists to tell stories that matter, stories that excite, inspire, and inform. Cronkite immerses students in covering sports at all levels in one of the country's top sports markets. It's this hands-on experience under the guidance of award-winning sports media veterans that shape the top journalist of tomorrow. If you cross the border lately, hackers may have your photo. They may also have your license plate information. Cronkite News reporter Bain Froney has more on the privacy breach. Photos and license plates of travelers collected at a, at a U.S. border point have been exposed in a cyber attack. That's according to U.S. Customs and Border Protection. The photos were taken of travelers exiting and entering the United States. U.S. Customs and Border Protection discovered the breach on May 31st. Media reports say that the collecting of photos of the license plates has been occurring for over a month and a half. Customs officials haven't released the location of the border crossings involved, but do say the breach involves nearly 100,000 people photographed. It is common for Arizona residents to cross the border. Roman Lopez works as a contractor in Arizona, but travels to Mexico every weekend. The news worried him. Someone has your plates and, you know, of course, if they're able to get to your plates, they're, they're going to be able to get to your, the whole information, where you live, uh, your family. Lopez isn't the only one concerned. Some Twitter users believe this could negatively impact tourism and how this could decrease the number of people going in and out of the country. One tweet says, people need to feel secure when crossing into the United States. Other Twitter users want to know what will happen to those whose information has been hacked and whether or not they will be notified. Customs and Border Protection has stated that none of the images has, have surfaced on the internet or the dark web. In the newsroom, I'm Bain Froney, Cronkite News. There's an increase in violence against Native American men and women on tribal land. Now, the U.S. Department of the Interior is working with tribal leaders to try and find solutions, especially when it comes to missing indigenous people. Reporter Tania Williamson has more on what actions will be put into place. A Department of Justice study shows that four out of five Native American men and women have experienced some kind of violence in their lifetime. Arizona is home to 22 indigenous tribes. Yesterday, local tribal leaders and those from across the country met in the Gila River Indian community to address this public safety issue. Arizona has the third highest counts of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, according to the Urban Indian Health Institute. This issue in particular led many to marches and advocating for change. It was part of the discussion yesterday among tribal leaders. These issues discussed today threaten the very safety and security of all of our tribal members. Domestic violence, missing and murdered Native Americans, and unsolved cold cases. Last month, Governor Doug Ducey signed House Bill 2570, which aims to gather more data on murdered indigenous women. Governor Stephen Lewis mentioned sharing data as a solution to problems faced in Indian country. Common themes emerge, nonetheless, around allowing tribes to determine where resources are needed in their communities and to the need for better sharing of information and data. Sharing that information is only part of the issue. There also needs to be better communication to the non-Native community. There are a number of women in this community who have led by example and very strong women. And Michelle Demert is uh, one of those advocates that I spoke about earlier in the sessions. Michelle Demert traveled from Alaska to voice her concerns. 40% of our Native communities have no law enforcement in Alaska. According to Demert, that lack of resources leaves many people without help. 
we have no 911. So when we call for, uh, in response to something that's happened our, in our communities, who appears? Often it's a tribal leader, and we have to wait hours, sometimes days, for a meaningful law enforcement response. Gila River Indian Community Governor Stephen Lewis says, while there's been progress, there's still a long way to go. We all agreed that more can and more must be done at all levels to break down those silos, to ensure we have comprehensive programs and policies to attack these issues. Governor Lewis said that he'll be reaching out to the president of the Salt River Indian community to start a dialogue on how tribal enforcement agencies can better share information to close those gaps. In the Broadcast Center, Tanaya Williamson, Cronkite News. One dentist office in the West Valley opens its doors once a year to veterans in need of care. Cronkite News reporter Kevin Fleischman shows us how this program has been going strong for the last six years. Start applying the topical gel, and we'll give that a minute, and then I'm going to start getting you numb, okay? <laughs> All right. On a regular Hi. Saturday, Aspen Dental is closed, uh, but today they but are treating I mean, veterans yeah. for free. What we're doing is basically, um, a patient comes in pain, we would do an extraction, or if they needed to have the nerve removed, we would do that. Basically, that's a single um, uh, procedure we could do for them, multiple she teeth if need be. Work. <laughs> yeah. While this veteran was getting some work done, his wife, Edna Smith, shared how grateful she was. It has to be a blessing to many people because it sure is to us, and there's so many that suffer, I'm sure, like my husband's been suffering. For this dentist, providing free services is a responsibility. For the people that put themselves out on the line for us, um, it means a lot to be able to provide a service for them. Um, and I think it's uh, a great opportunity to do that. Smith found out about the services on TV and encourages others like her husband to reach out to the VA. Ask, don't hesitate to ask at VA because they're very, they want the VA, they want their veterans to have the best. In good year, Kevin Fleischman, Cronkite News. Hi. This was the sixth annual veterans clinic for Aspen Dental, and they helped seven patients. Crossing paths with a venomous snake is probably not on your list of things to do this summer. But if you do, the Phoenix Herpetological Society offers training classes on how to handle the animals. In the desert, hearing the sound of a rattle usually means move away. But at the Phoenix Herpetological Society, people learn to coexist with the animals. We spend about an hour and a half in the classroom just talking about snakes, kind of addressing some of the common misunderstanding and myths that go along with snakes. Joe Himes is the venomous curator. He teaches classes on how to handle animals like rattlesnakes. Inside the classroom, participants start off with non-venomous snakes before moving on to the real deal. So the main reason why we start off with a non-venomous snake before moving on to the rattlesnake is just to make sure that everybody really understands what they're doing. So it's the, the part of the tail that people refer to as the coon tail. This is black and white like a raccoon's tail. Uh, look for some of the classic mistakes of not holding the lid right, not holding the tongs right, things that might lead to the snake being injured. Uh, that way when it's a venomous snake and they're really, there's something on the line if somebody gets bitten, hopefully their confidence is already there and they know what they're doing and uh, everybody can be safe about it. For beginners, the class offers peace of mind. I wanted to take the class because I had actually encountered a snake on my property before and I'm an, I love to hike, so encountering snakes does happen in my life. And for those who are more comfortable handling snakes, the class still has benefits. Mainly today was just to kind of like get the ball rolling on like trying to work with venomous snakes because snakes are my thing and I'd really like to kind of go into that and basically just get more experience. So this was really exciting to go through today. Samantha Dodd volunteers at PHS, but hopes to be the person you call when there's a snake that needs to be scooped up. And so I was really kind of just trying to work towards moving towards that, because you have to go through this class first before you're able to actually go out and do rattlesnake removals and stuff. Eve Hall just wants to be more comfortable when she's out enjoying the desert. I feel much more confident. I feel like I could do it now, you know. Um, I think even if a snake was a little more aggressive than the one I handled, I kind of feel confident in the distance that I need to be and the possible ways that the snake might move. So that makes me feel more confident as well. And just knowing that I can always take a step back. The Society offers classes through November and invites anyone who's curious to participate. 
Two Rattlers teammates hope to add an indoor football league title to a resume that includes championship appearances together at both the high school and collegiate levels. Cronkite News reporter Gabriel Moreno joins us as he charts their path to success. From high school to the indoor football league, Rattlers teammates Jeff Ziemba and Jabri Lolly share a championship bond that goes all the way back to their time at St. Mark's High School in Wilmington, Delaware. It's a great feeling um, being able to go from high school all the way to college and then even from college to here. Here being the indoor football league leading Arizona Rattlers. Quarterback Jeff Zemba and running back Jabri Lolly have been playing together since 2008. As teammates at St. Mark's, Zemba and Lolly won a state championship in 2010. That was crazy. Like we were losing by so much and like just looking back, that's a, that's a memory that you'll always have, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people have gotten there or maybe almost won. But like winning that with somebody who I'm still playing with, it's just, you know, it's a great memory to hold with you. After high school, Ziemba and Lolly joined forces again at Division II Shepherd University in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. I went on my, my uh, Shepherd University visit and realized that I loved it there and I wanted to be there. And uh, the second signing day was coming up and he, hasn't, he hadn't yet signed anywhere. So I talked to my coaches, they were asking for his film and they liked what they saw and ended up working out and they got both of us. Ziemba and Lolly led Shepard to its first championship game appearance in school history in 2015. In 2018, Ziemba joined the Arizona Rattlers and was named IFL Rookie of the Year. This season, Ziemba saw an opportunity to again team up with Lolly and recommended him to Rattlers head coach Kevin Guy. Jeff kind of turned us on to Lolly during the offseason and, and uh, we gave him a call and, and you know, closed the deal. Lolly credits Ziemba for his ability to quickly adjust to his new team. I didn't have to come in here being too nervous because I already knew somebody who kind of like knew the program and knows what's going on. So it definitely allowed me to get my feet wet a little faster and just get more comfortable here. The Rattlers look to close out a perfect regular season Saturday against the San Diego Strike Force. Gabriel Moreno, Cronkite News. On the next Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. An ethics probe finds problems with Representative David Schweikert's Washington office, and APS temporarily stops power shutoffs after a fatality tied to summer heat. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. How the blues can bring sounds of hope to a struggling town home to Muddy Waters and Sam Cook. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. I'm Anne Marie Slaughter, the CEO of New America. We're a distinctive community of problem solvers and storytellers who are committed to American renewal. I'd like to invite you to watch our new show, Innovating the Future, a joint production with Arizona State University. We'll talk with experts, analysts, and activists about the challenges our nation faces and the opportunity for solutions. So join us for Innovating the Future. Tonight at 7.30 on Arizona PBS. Paul Mary would likely debate your own choice of...